the early 1930s is normally viewed through the lens of two events, the Great Depression and the rise of the Nazi party in Germany. The latter, which carried a series of events that led Germany to start the Second World War. However, another nation had a similar series of events, a goal of expanding its territory in the face of powerful neighbors by any means necessary. For Germany, this was the Ausschluss of Austria and the occupation of Czechoslovakia. For Japan, that was the Asian continent. In this video, we'll be looking at the Japanese invasion of Manchuria. So normally I have a bunch of background information that gets all of you somewhat caught up on events. However, the history surrounding this conflict and after is extremely long and somewhat complicated. So what you'll get is a much more abbreviated, hitting super major points list, as many of the events that I'll be talking about each warrant a 20 or 30 minute video on their own. Japanese territorial ambitions in China had been a national directive dating back many centuries, but it wasn't until the late 19th century that Japan managed to finally get a major foothold on the continent. The 1895 Sino-Japanese War was a humiliating defeat for Queen China, as the no longer isolated and now modernized Japanese forces defeated the much longer Queen armies and managed to acquire a number of territories off of them. These territorial concessions included the island of Taiwan and it shifted Korea into the Japanese sphere of influence. In 1904, the Russo-Japanese War broke out, which resulted in Japan making even more territorial gains and humiliating the Russians in the process. Korea was vassalized in 1905 and annexed as an imperial territory in 1910, accomplishing a centuries-long goal of the Japanese nation. Following World War I, islands in the Pacific that the Germans held were granted to the nation as well. However, disagreements during the actual treaty process and many of the arm and naval treaties years after put a strain on relations between the West and Japan. Japan had also attempted to assert heavy influence in the Russian Far East during the nation's civil war slash revolution. They sent over 70,000 troops into the area surrounding Vladivostok, over five times what the Western Allies had put forth in the region. This attempt was to get a puppet government headed by white Russian forces to serve Japanese interests and allow the island nation to use the resource-rich area for their own gain. However, the white Russian movement fell apart in the early 20s, and political differences back at home, as well as pressure from the Western powers, prevented Japan from annexing the territory for itself. This alone destroyed the unity that the government had during World War I, and the military government and civilian government would be locked in bitter competition for years after. By 1930, the civilian government had largely lost its control over the military, who now acted with heavy degrees of autonomy. This loss of control had been ongoing ever since the 1880s, with the creation of the Army and Naval Commanding Staffs. These staffs were equal in power to the Minister of War, and answered directly to the Emperor, rather than having to go through the civilian government. The Army and Navy also had decisive say on the formation of any civilian government, since the law required that the posts of Army Minister and Navy Minister be filled by active duty officers, and since the law also required that a Prime Minister resign if he could not fill all of his cabinet posts, both the Army and Navy had final say on the formation of a cabinet, and could bring down the cabinet at any time by withdrawing their minister and refusing to nominate a successor. While this only happened once, the threat always loomed high when the military made any demands on the civilian leadership. Even with the military in essential control of the government in Japan, the Kwaintong army in Korea largely ignored or acted in direct defiance of the headquarters in Japan. Many of its senior leaders advocated political change in Japan through the overthrow of the democratically elected civilian government, denouncing it as a liberal evil and wanted to heavily strengthen the power of the Japanese emperor in its place. They also advocated a more aggressive, expansionist foreign policy regarding the Asian mainland, eyeing the whole of China as ripe for the taking. 
During the same time, China had just sort of unified after the Deadly Warlords period, yet many factions continued to either fight against or work directly against the nationalist government. Japan had influenced northern warlords in Manchuria since the early 20s, but when the faction fell apart, they were left with little in the way of powerful supporters in the provinces, and they decided to correct this wrong. The chance came in mid-1931, following two incidents, the first being the Wanpo Shan incident, which was a very minor affair between Chinese and Korean farmers in the small village of Wanpo Shan. The Koreans were building a dam and irrigation system from land that they leased from a local broker. This trench included several miles of land that they did not lease and were owned by local Chinese. A group of Chinese farmers drove the Koreans out, and the police came in and dispersed the Chinese with no casualties. While this may seem like a very small incident, public reaction was not. Anti-Chinese riots erupted in many Korean cities, and many anti-Korean riots happened in China. However, China alleged that over 700 casualties occurred from this incident, with many local farms being burnt to the ground. This led to mass murder of ethnic Koreans throughout China, with a death toll reaching in the tens of thousands. This act nearly caused war between the two, but calmer heads sort of prevailed, and war was averted for the time. Yet, the Japanese army in Korea was looking for another opportunity to invade China. They'd get this chance with the Mukden incident on September the 18th of 1931. Colonel Shishiro Itaki and Lieutenant Colonel Kanji Iswara of the Kuantung Army devised a plan to force a Japanese invasion on Manchuria. A rail line existed not far from a Chinese garrison under Shan Shulian, and while the location had no formal name and no real military significance, they figured that by destroying a section of this line, they'd be able to garner enough support for a fallout invasion using the incident as pretext. They placed explosives near the tracks, but far enough away to do no real damage. Late on September the 18th, the explosions were detonated. The next morning, two Japanese artillery batteries from their companies opened fire on the Chinese garrison. The small Air Force garrison was destroyed, and 500 Japanese soldiers attacked the nearly 7,000 garrisoning troops. The Chinese troops were no match for the experienced Japanese soldiers, and by the evening, the fighting was over and the Japanese had occupied Mukden at the cost of 500 Chinese lives and only two lives for Japan. Julian ordered his troops to not fire upon the Japanese following this and to store away their arms. The Japanese proceeded to occupy the major cities of Changshun and Antan and their surrounding areas with minimal difficulty. The military governor in the region, Ma Zain Shan, began to resist the Japanese by November. This was followed by Generals Ting Shao and Li Du with their provisional forces. Between September the 20th and September the 25th, Japanese forces took a number of major cities in the Laonian province, essentially giving them full control over the area. Tokyo was shocked by the news of the army acting without orders from the central government with the civilian government being thrown into disarray by the insubordination. But as reports of one quick victory after another began to arrive, it felt powerless to oppose the army, and instead sent three more divisions from Japan to aid in the effort. Using the repair of the bridge at Nen River as pretext, the Japanese sent a repair party under protection to the Chinese-held location. Fighting erupted between the Japanese forces and troops loyal to the acting governor of Haolongshin, General Ma Shanshan. Ma Shanshan would become a hero in China for his defense at the bridge, even though his troops suffered heavy casualties. His defense would be a main drive for many individuals to join an anti-Japanese militia in the region. This militia would go on to fight against the Japanese occupation for nearly 14 years, and prevented the whole of Manchuria from being pacified. The Chinese government in Nanjing largely collapsed following the invasion, and when it reformed in late December of 1931, they ordered all Chinese forces to retreat behind the Great Wall, effectively giving the whole of southern Manchuria over to the Japanese. The last major Chinese forces in northern Manchuria were led by General Tin Shao, who organized the defense of Harbin. 
Xiao managed to hold out for 17 hours with poorly equipped and largely untrained civilian militia. He would surrender on February the 24th, officially ending major regular army hostilities in Manchuria. Within days, Henry Pu, former Emperor of China that was deposed in 1911, was made Emperor of the Japanese puppet state of Manchukuo, and Ma Sanshan was bribed to switch allegiances and managed to keep his post as governor. The peace wouldn't last long, however. By April of 1932, just two months following the formation of Manchukuo, Sanshan would revolt against the Japanese, along with Tin Shao and General Li Hashin. Together, these men had over 300,000 under their command, and they would stage major guerrilla strikes and ambushes against Japanese and Manchu forces. What took the Japanese just three months to occupy would cost them over a decade to pacify. And with that, another chapter in forgotten history comes to an end. I hope you